Yo, 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 it's your boy Glenn Lawrence, and I'm back with another one. Yes, sir, I am back. And no, we are not going to be doing another episode of Calling Out Names. Well, not yet. We might get there, but we'll see. No, but today, what we're going to be talking about is, well, we're going to listen to an audio. We're going to listen to an audio recording that I did. Um, for those of you know that I am in the entertainment industry, I'm an actor as well as an editor. Um, I also do voiceovers. Uh, I am the the book reader, where I will be the voice of R.P. Thor's newest book that he's currently working on. And I have done voiceovers for commercials, public service announcements. Um, and although I don't have tons of experience in it, I decided I wanted to try something out. And so what I decided to do is I decided to read one of Rolo's blogs to practice my voiceover cadence and um, style. So while I was reading it, I found this to be very fascinating of an article because it speaks to a lot of what we're really dealing with today in our current um, culture and our current society. And I find that, you know, what he was talking about when he wrote this blog. Now, mind you, he wrote this blog a little bit ago, a couple of years back. I found that it was very interesting that the stuff that he's mentioning here is something that we actually are dealing with. All right. So without further ado, let's get in it, uh, shall we? Remove the Man, written by Rolo Tomasi, January 8th, 2019. In October of 2017, I wrote an essay titled Male Control. It was actually the second time I've covered the topic of how a feminine primary social order, a gynocracy, if you will, seeks to control its male population by deliberately sowing confusion about masculinity into multiple generations of boys and later men. Prior to this, I've written another seminal post titled Remove the Man, in which is outlined the ways in which the gynocracy makes effort to systematically remove men from our language. Usually this takes the form of erasing the letters M-A-N from the English language wherever it appears in an official capacity i.e. state bylaws, universities, legislative documents, but also in gender-neutral translations of the Bible now. The only real constant in all of this, the deliberate erasure of men or men from that language. But if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. Quote by George Orwell. I wrote Remove the Man back in 2013 in response to one such effort by the governor of Washington, Jay Inslee, who passed a bill to make state laws gender neutral. The effort actually began in 2017, but in 2019, a simple search for gender neutral language will show you the extent and the scope of this much larger effort. This essay served and the starting point for a larger awareness for me that of the push to remove men and masculinity from more than just our language, but rather the removal of all things conventionally masculine. As Orwell states here, the thought, the thinking about masculinity and men is the focus of the corruption. But language is only one way that the concept of what is masculine is distorted for a purpose. Today, Today the, American the American Psychological Association, Association let me point out here that he's not entirely wrong or wrong at all what he's saying. There was a push for gender neutral language. You know, they wanted to get rid of policemen to police officers because for some reason it offended women who were police women and not police men. Okay. I, I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you what they say. Um, this right here. I found interesting because I thought it was just like, okay, we're just not going to call them policemen anymore. We're going police officers, you know, to differentiate the genders. Well, now they're legally passing laws and changing the way we use language, not only just to remove men, but to make it inclusive. 
Okay. Um, this is this lady right here is uh, Dr. Ann Miliana Ribeiro. Um, and this is from Oregon State, Oregon, yeah, Oregon, Oregon University, Oregon State University or whatever. Um, and this is one, one page of multiple I'll show you, but so why use gender neutral language? Well, language matters. I bet you could think of some words you cannot say in a certain company. I don't know what she's talking about. You can also, I imagine, think of words that have been used to offend, to discriminate against, or oppress. Maybe like racial slurs, but not normal language. What we say and how we say it matters. Your words have power to include a diverse audience or set boundaries of a conversation by leaving some people out. So let's start with nouns. Most English nouns do not have a grammatical, grammatical gender form. For example, teacher or president. Words ending in M man are most commonly used, used gender nouns in English. These words are easy to spot and replace with more neutral language. So at first you would think that they were talking about inclusion for women. If they're a congresswoman or a congress, you know, or a police woman, that would be, you know, proper, right? Changing the, the noun or pronoun to fit the individual in the uniform or acting in that role. But now they're saying a 2018 Pew research showed that 25% of millennials and 35% of Gen Zers knew someone who uses gender neutral pronouns as they. So, because more people are are considering themselves either non-binary or gender fluid or whatever, we have to change our language. Okay. Um, let's start with nouns. Okay. So, we did that. Um, these words are easy to spot out and replace with more gender neutral language. For example, instead of the gendered noun mankind, you can use the word people or humanity. Or human beings. Well, right there, human. What are we going to call them? Hugh woman? Hugh things? I don't know. Instead of using gender freshman, you can use the words first year student. It's ridiculous. Some nouns that once ended in man, for example, fireman, have a neutral equivalent that are used to include all genders. Firefighter. Like, do you, do you see how ridiculous this is? This is very ridiculous. Um, now let's talk about pronouns and possessive pronouns. English offers no widely accepted pronoun choice for gender neutral third person singular nouns that refer to people. You cannot call a person an it. Why not? The case is, is the case is similar with possessive until somewhat recently in the sentence every student must submit his assignment by the due date. The masculine possessive his would be used to refer to any student in the group that may include male, female, and gender non-binary people. However, in today's linguistic context, it not only makes your writing sound outdated. But it's but it also is exclusionary, exclusionary of female gender and non-binary people. That is, people whose gender identity does not conform to the gender binary. So basically, what they're saying is you can't say that as a teacher. If I if a teacher said, um, Every student must turn in his assignment by the due date. Well, you're not including females or gender non-binary people. Well, if I was a student, I'd be like, well, I'm non-binary, so you didn't say I had to turn in my homework by the due date. <laughs> Stupid. You know, so instead, try making nouns sound more plural. For example, the sentence that can be easily rephrased as, a student 
on Zoom can turn his camera off. This revised sentence could be the student on, on Zoom could turn their camera off. Okay. I mean, yeah, you could do that. If I'm just, if I'm talking to a group of, you know, men, I'm going to say men, this is stupid. So as, as you can see what, you know, Rollo is pointing out something that he saw going on in the early, you know, or in around mid 2000s, right? The 2019 or whatever. Actually, he started writing this blog this point in 2013, I think you said. So in 2013, he was seeing this and it was starting in, he said, Washington state. Well, now you could see like, okay, maybe schools, they're pushing this because schools are very liberal. Schools are more, you know, ran by liberals and stuff like that. But it's not going further than that, is it? Well, no, it is. It's actually going much further than that. Um, where is it? Okay, yes. So they are pushing, it's part of like this gender rights thing. Hold on, where is it at? Ah. Um, there's laws now. The U.S. Congress, new gender law, neutral language. Okay. The U.S. Congress, new gender language, 14 items are a no-no. 14 terms that are a no-no. Okay. Um, on the first day of 2021, new rules were outlined for gender neutral language in the U.S. Congress. A press release from the House Committee on Rules outlined details of the package that meant that meant to promote inclusion and diversity. The release said a few changes would have made, and they included establishing a select committee on economic disparity and fairness growth requiring okay, blah blah blah, addressing issues and inequalities, race, gender, okay, blah 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 blah. blah. Honoring all gender identities by changing pronouns and family relationships in the house rules to be a gender neutral speech. So what do they mean by that? Well, U.S. Congress new gender neutral language himself and herself will be replaced with themselves. Chairman will become chair. Seaman will become, will be replaced with seafarers. Mother, father, daughter, son, sister, and brother will be replaced with terms like parent and child, sibling. Submit his or her resignation will be replaced with resign. He or she serves and he or he, she holds will be replaced with such member delegate or resident commissioner serves or holds office of the whistleblower ombudsman will be replaced with office of the whistleblower ombuds. <laughs> you know, Kevin McCarthy, speaker of the house said, this is stupid father, son, brother. <laughs> and I agree, you know, um, so, uh, Guy, whatever his last name is, said uh, the prayer to open the uh, 117th Congress ended with a man and a woman. A man is a Latin for so be it. It's not a gendered word. Unfortunately, facts are irrelevant to progressives. Unbelievable. Well, it's that's that's pretty stupid. If you end a prayer and you can't say just a man without saying a woman, that's pretty dumb. So the new inclusive language list is also backed by many. Um, the Hill reports that these gender neutral languages include examples are being put into place because of an increase in LGBT and lawmakers joining the new Congress. The Hill said. The latest rule acknowledges a spectrum of gender identities as well as same-sex relationships. Still, there is no non-binary representatives either in the House or Senate. 
and the nation's first openly non-binary lawmaker was elected just last year. Really? We have one? Hmm. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty stupid. All right, back to this. Here we go. Issued its first, Issued its first ever, ever guidelines, guidelines for practice with boys and men. In it, the concept of conventional or traditional masculinity is outlined as harmful. The main thirst of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity, marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression, is on the whole harmful. Men socialized in this way are less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. It would be easy to refute this basic presumption with countless examples of how all these traits, most of which are innate part of men's evolved mental firmware have been key in developing a civil society as well as a healthy masculine identity. But what we're seeing in this is a corruption of language that is leading to the standardization of the corruption of thought. Stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression are evolved aspects of the male psyche that have served men for millennia. To the red pill aware man, this is self-evident. What is less evident is the new context in which these educated men apply meaning to these terms. Academia has so thoroughly assimilated by the feminine imperative that the men making official decrees about psychological principles no longer have the insight to understand that the perspective is informed by the female correct thought. There are two presumptions being made here. First, is that men's predisposition for stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression are the results of a patriarchal society adverse influence on boys and men. The belief is found in the blank slate social constructionism. I address this in old lies. They hate the very idea. So let me let me point out here. This is uh, very important to um, point out too. So their, their belief, the APA came out and wrote saying that um, traditional or con conventional masculinity or masculine traits are harmful or toxic, as they said. And um, they were doing that. And when they did that, so they basically said every man that, that holds these traditional masculine traits that don't conform to this feminine, you know, imperative, you know, understanding of what men should or how men should behave should be considered toxic. That's what they're saying. They're saying that men should be considered toxic if they hold these views. And how ridiculous does that sound? So if you're a traditional masculine man, and if you don't cry and emote like they say you should, they're going to list you as toxic. And so their belief is that, you know, um, the only reason why um, people are, our boys are this toxic is because of um, conditioning, that they were conditioned to be this way. All right. And that's pretty ridiculous. So let me show you what the blank slate is. All right. I'm going I'm to tell you what the definition of this blank slate meaning is. Um, here it is. Well, there's, I don't want to just, there we go. Here we go. What is the blank slate? A blank slate is a philosophical term for a theoretical state of mind existing in infant human beings. It is related to the Latin term tabula rasa, referring to an unmarked writing surface. According to the theory, humans are born entirely free of thoughts or ideas, only gaining them after exposure to family and society. The idea of tabula rasa has been around for at least a thousand years but most strongly identified with the 17th century philosopher, John Locke. <clears throat> Recent scientific discoveries have challenged the idea, 
suggesting that genetic factors shape some characteristics of the human mind. The Latin term tabula rasa is generally translated as blank slate. Although a more accurate translation would be a race slate, before paper was widely available, people in many societies would write would make writing tablets from minerals called slates. Marking on these tablets are called, or well, the markings on these tablets are also called slates, could be erased so the tablet could be reused. In ancient Rome, these tablets were sometimes covered with wax, which would be heated to remove markings for reuse. These objects give modern English and uh, the expressions clean slate and blank slate. All right, so the concept of blank slate in human intelligence was first championed by the 10th century Islamic philosopher, I'm not saying their name because I don't know how to pronounce it, and better known as, I'm not saying that either, okay, here we go, um, proposed that humankind, human mind at birth was pure potential without form or content. The idea conflicted with the prevailing belief of the European philosopher philosophy at the time that human babies was inhibited at birth by pre-existing by pre-existing soul. Aside from a few philosophers, the idea was largely ignored for the next 1600 years. 600 years. All right? In Amazon is Amazon actually giving oh no, it's stupid. All right, so near the end of the same century, the British philosopher John Locke published his first influential treatise, an essay concerning human understanding. Locke proposed that the human mind at birth is empty of ideas, thoughts, or personality, all of which are added by subsequent experience, education, and observation. Locke's ideas were highly influential throughout the following centuries when Sigmund Freud developed his ideas of psychology in 1890s. He proposed that the human personality is entirely formed by early childhood experiences on a mind that is otherwise like a blank slate. So basically what they're saying is that when you were born, there was no innate desires or things in, that were installed in you. You know, like boys were not drawn to play more sports or be active or rough house naturally. No, no, no. They only learned this by observing their fathers or other people rough housing or playing. Yeah. That boys are just, were only taught to be masculine by watching other masculine or men exhibit masculine behavior. That it is not innately a natural thing for them, that they are taught this and they observe this type of behavior. So they mimic it. That's their opinion. I call bullshit. All right. But. Studies in the brain, I'm going to read this right here, this part, then we'll go back to the audio. Um, no, what the hell is this? Studies in the brain and science, science and psychology have demonstrated that many traits such as sexuality, emotion, and even language skills may be influenced by genetic factors. Other studies suggest that a framework of personality may exist at birth, even if the actual personality is not formed until later. Psychologist Steven Pinker's 2002 book, The Blank Slate, collects many of these theories, presenting a challenge for the tabula rasa idea. The concept of the blank slate remains a subject of lively discussion and debate among scientists and philosophers. So this is not even a really widely held view, and there is actually no science or data to actually back it up and support this blank slate theory. It's a theory that people are running with because especially people that are wanting this egalitarian mindset and, and, you know, say that genders are not different. Men and women are not different that, you know, they're exactly the same is ridiculous, but it supports their narrative you know, for especially the feminists, the feminists, you know, run with this narrative saying that, oh, I could do anything that a man can do, but they can't. 
Okay. They may be able to do some things, but there's some things that they struggle with. And if they could do exactly the same thing that men could do, if, if, if we're going to run with their, their thought here, if, if we're going to run with this theory, if women could do exactly the same thing men could do, then why in the military do we have two different standards for physical exercise? See, we have a criteria in the military that men have to do X amount of push-ups, X amount of sit-ups, and be able to run the mile and a half or two miles in a certain amount of time. Women don't have to meet those same standards. Why is that? Because we're not blank slates. Interesting, huh? So if we're willing to accept that, if we're willing to accept that, um, if we're willing to accept that we are different in some areas, or at least the physical capability, why are we not willing to accept that we there may be other areas, such as the way that we process information, or the way that our brain is wired, or the way that we naturally are inclined to do, men are inclined to do some activities and women are more inclined to exhibit some behaviors differently than the opposite sex. Why aren't we willing to accept that? No clue. But that's what the blank slate means. So what he was saying is that their theory of the blank slate and saying that, you know, men are toxic that exhibit these traditional or conventional behaviors is all based on learned behavior. It's not natural to them. They're just taught this. And so they think that they could basically teach the masculine out of men. Or that if there was no masculine traits or conventional masculine traits, that boys would not be, you know, boys, basically. Basically, they just want to be able to outlaw conventional and traditional masculinity and tell you if you exhibit these behaviors that you're toxic and you're wrong and therefore teach you how to be what they considered a, a good man or a good male. Because you can't say man because that would be genderizing them. And we all know that they're pushing for gender neutrality here. But back to the audio here. That a boy might boy act might in act accordance in a... with an inborn masculine proclivity. They hate the idea that a boy might learn to be tough and resilient at the expense of a vulnerability weakness because it contradicts the equalist belief set. They hate the idea that boys and girls have innately biologically different ways of dealing with emotions that don't align with their belief in a blank slate. To force them to accept this would be to force them to abandon deeply ego-invested beliefs that they themselves have conditioned into them by the same feminine primary education. Boys don't naturally emote like girls, but when they refuse to align with the female correct way of emoting, we say that some patriarchal macho man somewhere, in some movie, in some song, in some household, taught that kid not to feel. He somehow learned that allowing his emotions to rule over him, to be vulnerable, to prioritize his feelings above his sense of rational self, is what actually is a weakness. That, in our evolutionary past, was far likelier to get him killed than to earn the praise of his equalist teachers. Boys are simply not as emotional as girls. Our brains didn't evolve that way. But because we value the feminine above the masculine, today we say this kid is doing it wrong. We say he learned to be an asshole from his macho dad. Or he learned to love firearms because of the latest rap song or toxically masculine society that doesn't exist. Now granted, the men responsible for these psychological practices and their standardization tried to walk back the idea that conventionally masculine attributes weren't all bad. This is expected because an aspect like stoicism can still be considered useful to a feminine primary social order. It's just that the larger social order wants the aspect of masculinity to manifest 
on its own terms and serving a female-centric utility. A determined, hard-driving man is what they want when the floodwaters start rising and women need to be carried to safety. But when a man uses that aspect of his masculine nature for his exclusive benefit or a purpose that conflicts with feminine primacy, that's when the aspect is defined as dangerous. However, the overall preconception is that there is some sinister influence of an old-school chauvinistic patriarchy teaching boys and men to be toxically masculine. I address this fallacy in Old Lies, but this is one more example of how a femme-centric society must cling to a cliché parody of how boys must be taught in order to cover the fact that boys are raised like defective girls today. Okay, so let me let me address some of the things that he says here. So, what they're saying was that so once they re, you know listed that conventional masculinity is toxic, and that you know men that act in that way are bad or whatever. I don't know why they didn't think that there's going to be any pushback, but there was a lot of pushback. I remember when they released that in twenty I think eighteen, um, they were talking about that, and I was like, well, I choose not to go to any counselor that or any psychologist or you know um who actually upholds the apa you know belief because if they uphold that and they're basically saying that i'm just toxic naturally then they're always going to just assume that i'm the problem and i was no i was not going to go with that i think that was stupid so what they realized is that, well, they had to walk it back some. Okay. So they're like, well, look, it's not all toxic. And so basically they walked it back to try to, you know, save some face here. But really what they're saying is that, you know, no, these things are not all toxic as long as they're used in this way. So, you know, aggression, it's only appropriate if it's, you're being aggressive to defend a woman. Okay. That's the only time you're allowed to be aggressive where it's appropriate in their eyes. Um, being stoic. Okay. Um, you're only allowed to be a stoic if like, for example, we're under attack and Russia hit the beaches of Los Angeles and are destroying or trying to overthrow California. See, that's the great time for men to be stoic because we need you guys not to cry like us and be emotional. And, and hide. No, no, no. We need you to go out there and fight and defend us. But men will only be, men can only do that if they're able to be stoic because they want men to be emotional and vulnerable. So, you know, if guys are emoting and crying and, and, and you know, rocking back and forth and hiding like the girls are, well, then Russia is just going to walk right over here and just take over without any resistance. And who knows they might do, they might rape all the women and the guys will just still be sitting there crying. So they're like, oh, no, no, we need, we need to, we, you guys are allowed to be your natural selves as long as it benefits our behavior or our outcome. So yes, you're allowed to protect women. Go ahead, be aggressive, be aggressive, be, be aggressive and defend us. But you're not allowed to be aggressive in any other form. Competitiveness? No, you're not allowed to do that. That's bad. Because why, why do we have these standards? Why is there first place? Why is there last place? Why do, why do we have these things? No, competitiveness is not good. But when it suits them, it is good because they want, you know, the hot, fit, you know, attractive guy, right? That's who they want to date. So if guys weren't competitive and guys did not decide to go put in the work and work on themselves, work on their, you know, goals and desires and, you know, reach a good career and, and earn a lot of money. Then they knew that women would not be interested in them. So if I was a fat slob that looked like shit, that was broke, living in my parents' basement, no woman would want to be with me. Even the ugly fat ones would reject me. But because I work out, because I work hard, I'm a I'm considered attractive to a lot of women. Well, why is that? Because I put in the work to be competitive in a sexual 
marketplace. So I'm working hard on elevate or you know leveling up my SMV so that I could be attractive and have a wide variety of interest rather having no interest. Oh, that's okay. That, that, that's okay to be competitive that way. But if you're trying to be competitive in another other way, it's not good. Or if they want to compete with you, the fact that you ha could have these standards or you have these you know, criteria for people that partake in this type of you know, event or whatever, and they don't meet them, well, that's wrong. So you see, it's really, they try to pick and choose when and how you are allowed to exhibit these innate, natural, you know, behaviors and instincts that you have. As long as it benefits their feminine, feminine outcome, as long as it promotes and supports their gynocracy. So let's let them continue some more. What is glaringly ignored is that these traits and many more are endemic parts of men's evolved nature. Our emotional natures are not the same as that of women's. Our brains are not wired the same as women's. Men and women process emotion differently from the other, particularly negative emotions. This is a feature of the male brain not a bug. But today, the APA has decided unilaterally that men's way of dealing with emotion is incorrect. Incorrect because the only correct way would be one that aligns with the women's interests that's been conditioned to believe are the only beneficial to larger society. To the APA, masculinity itself is a bug. Secondly, this deliberate misconception relies entirely on social constructionism and almost entirely ignores the biological factors that contribute to masculine gender identity. Secondly, this deliberate misconception relies entirely on social constructionism and almost entirely ignores the biological factors that contribute to a masculine gender identity. I'm presently working on another essay that explores the dependency on blank slate equalism as the basis for virtually every presumption the mainstream has about gender identity. So I don't want to give too much away. However, the whole presumption of gender in humanist psychology depends on the falsehood that men and women are functionally co-equal. Accepting that failed notion of blank slate egoism is what scaffolds the entire premise of the standard of masculinity. Masculinity is something that cannot be removed from society if its source is something that is unique to only men by virtue of their biology. They cannot ensure female correctness as a societal standard if men and women are different. People like those in authority at the APA know this. It is why merely talking about those innate gender differences is deemed a hate crime today. Inspiring doubt in the blank slate standard risks destroying the scaffolding for all their preconceptions of gender. In the end, this is one more, I think, significant effort in removing men and conventional masculinity from our collective thoughts. So let me let me point out there that what he's saying, right, is like this effort to, you know, remove or to call innate natural masculine traits toxic or harmful is an effort to remove it, you know, the masculine from our language. And as like I already pointed out, they have already removed masculine nouns or pronouns or words from our language because they said that it's not inclusive enough. But, you know, we could always alter the words and say congressman, congresswoman, chairman, chairwoman. But now because that's not good enough because now we have this non-binary trans community that they don't feel included. And let's face it, because of their <laughs> mental health issue, because I will say it, anybody that believes that they're transgender or non-binary have a mental health issue. The DSM-4 had it listed as gender um identity disorder and it was listed as a psychological 
mental health issue. Okay. Now they have changed it to gender dysphoria. And they try to move, remove the stigma of it being a mental health issue. Basically trying to make it widely accepted as a normality or something normal. All right. And let's be real. It's not natural or normal for you to feel that you belong in a different gender. The reason why is because, well, how do you know that you are not in the gender that you are born with, that that's not the right gender? You have never had another gender. You never experienced what it's physically like to be in a body of a woman or a man if you're, you know. So if you're a guy and you were born as a guy, that dick between your legs is all you know. You don't know what it's like to have boobs. You don't know what it's like to have vagina lips. You don't know what it's like to go through women's menstruation. So for you to say that you belong in a different body, that you were born in a wrong body, that's pretty crazy because you have nothing to reference it or refer it to. You were never a woman before. So you can't say that you're in the wrong body. Does that make sense? So for people to say that, that's, that's, a, that's a sign of mental health issues. Okay. And if they want to play dress up, if they want to be trans, that's fine. You could identify all you want as that. But with these new, you know, gender neutral language laws and, and things that they're implementing, they're trying to force people to not only, you know, um, change the language and remove the masculine from the language. But now they're trying to make it to where we are forced to promote really their delusion. So, for example, if somebody decides to, some guy decides that he is a woman, he's a transgender, he wants to be a trans woman now, and he dresses up like a woman, they have passed laws to where if he was an employee of mine, I could be held responsible for calling him either by his legal name, if he chooses not to go by his legal name, let's say his name is John, that's his driver's license. And that's what he, that's what, that's, that's on my payroll is John. And he chooses, he wants to go by Joanna. But if I refer to him as John, I could get sued because I'm not acknowledging his desired gender, meaning I am not referring to him in by the delusional identity that he wants to be because I am referring to him by his legal name that's on his driver's license on his birth certificate that if I choose not to refer to him that way, that I could get sued. That's pretty crazy. And that started from, you know, it stems from like, where did that come from? Where does all this, like, now you have to refer to people as they, them, or, you know, you can't refer to a chairman, you have to refer to a chairperson or a chair or whatever they're calling it. You can't call it a police man because it could be a police officer. Like they're purposely doing this. And it started from removing the masculine, removing men from the language. And now they're replacing it with more inclusive language for a very small minority of community. And it's really interesting. Like, where did this like push come from? When we think of the feminine imperative or the gynocracy, where is that coming from? Think about that question while we play the rest of this.
This standardization of how men should be dealt with in therapy or colored by in just considering men's role in psychology is an ideological power play. Modern psychology officially doesn't get men anymore. The latest diagnostic and statistical manual, DSM, will now officially list traditional masculinity as a hazard or disorder for male humans. They can't be called men because that would gender them. I've read a few Twitter threads about this change in the DSM, and I think they're worth reading to get a better grasp of the gravity of the standardization. On December 29, 2018, I made some pretty ominous predictions about what I thought the manosphere and men in general could expect to see in 2019 to 2020. We're not eve a week into the first month, and a lot of what I expected is starting to develop. The gender divide is now a gender cold war, and going forward, I see the polarization between the sexes becoming even uglier than the 2016 election cycle. This issuance from the APA is a foundation for how psychology, our lord of the new church, will define what is acceptably male and what is not. Furthermore, it defines what aspects of masculinity is officially hazardous based on the social constructionism and science denial. Going forward, I think red pill aware men will have to view mainstream psychology with even more suspicion than we do already. My Redman Group colleague, Ryan Stone, has mentioned that this equivalent of a papal bull from the APA represents a call to action for the red pill community and the manosphere in general to help men understand that conventional, traditional masculinity is not a disorder. The red pill saves lives. I could only see this standardization as a net negative for men who are already five times more likely than women to take their own lives. Men seeking psychological help will only find their problems compounded by the psychologists trained to believe masculinity is inherently toxic. And as a result, we need to prepare to help our blue pill brothers unplug and show them their inherent worth as conventionally masculine men. So, I want you guys to think about that. Think about what was in the article. Think about what's going on in our current society. Do you not see how they're constantly pushing to remove men, to replace men, to, you know, redefine everything there's an agenda there's a push for it and it's important for us to be aware of these things and what's going on because one that helps us navigate interaction it helps us um react or respond to things knowing is half the battle So if you like the video and um, like I said, this was like first time doing this. So, you know, if you guys want more um, audio, you know, breakdowns, you want me to read some more blogs, um, let me know Um, if you want to uh, um, sponsor one, you could go ahead and uh, do that by um, clicking the cash app link below. And when you sponsor one, I will read whatever um, blog post or article that you want me to break down or give my interpretation on um, as a exclusive episode. So uh, if you feel so inclined to do that, go ahead, do that. If you want to donate, just support the channel, support the effort. Uh, please feel free to do that as well. Um, if not, great. Just hit the like, hit the subscribe button, whatever. I just uh, want to give the guys the opportunity um, to get some uh, exclusive content. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, please feel free to tell me in the comments. If you don't like what I'm saying, you go ahead and tell me that. And you can tell me to fuck off. I don't care. Um, but I would love to get your guys' opinion on what you guys thought about this video. So let me know. Until next time, peace.